Hello, my name is John White and I'm a member of the Low Intervention Beekeeping Group. We're based uh, just west of Reading in Pangbourne and um, this talk is about checkerboarding. I think the whole uh, craft of beekeeping is absolutely amazing, but for many of us, um, the whole issue of swarming and all that it entails is to say the least challenging. The knock on the door from neighbours, the number of swarm inspections, the impact that uh, all those inspections have on the colony, um, the mitigation measures that we need to take to, um, to offset swarming, the list is long. And so three years ago, we began experimenting with a little known method of swarm prevention called checkerboarding to prevent swarming. And we believe that based on our findings, this really does work. let me start off with a question which of these do you think has the greatest priority for bees is it the parent colony or is it the issuing swarm from that parent colony which of these do you think has the greatest priority for bees and um, I started folding this into the talks I give on checkerboarding because I think it is the understanding of this this dynamic and honeybee behavior in general that really um, underpins the great understanding the person who originated this concept had for bees. So just hold that thought and uh, which of these is the, has the greatest priority. And it may, this talk may either confirm your thoughts or it may uh, change your thinking on which of these has the greatest priority. So what is checkerboarding? Checkerboarding involves taking a box of stores above the brood nest and merging it with a box of drawn empty comb so that the two boxes alternate with frames of honey, drawn comb, honey, drawn comb, hence the name the checkerboarding. It's something you need to do only once. So we do it once and then thereafter the job's done. You don't need to repeat this exercise. And what it does is over time, the bees, this fracturing of the stores, the bees become aware of the spaces above the brood nest and the, where their roof is, the changing aspect of where their roof is. And their natural impulse is to recreate this honey reserve. In other words, to infill it. And if I was to stop there, that is essentially the essence of checkerboarding. It's the manipulation of the stores above the brood. It doesn't require going into the brood. And if you do that successfully with a couple of other aspects, that will offset swarming. Like a lot of things, it sounds almost too good to be true. But in this case, I believe, we believe that it really does work. So there are three key elements to checkerboarding. The stores, this manipulation of the stores above the brood. When you do it, the timing. And thereafter, making sure and allowing lots of space. So where did this idea originate from? It came from a chap called Walter Wright who passed away in 2016. Walter Wright was a NASA engineer, troubleshooting engineer, and he took up beekeeping after he'd retired to supplement his own, uh, his income, the income from his pension. And one of the amazing things about Walter Wright was he didn't want, uh, he knew nothing about beekeeping when he took it up. He didn't want a mentor. He didn't want a, uh, to join a book, uh, a beekeeping society, and he didn't want to read any books. He wanted to literally uh, treat beekeeping as a troubleshooting exercise and base everything on his own observations. And I think this is a unique aspect about Walter Wright and something I've not heard of or seen elsewhere. And so he began asking beekeepers, once he'd got his feet under the table and had a good idea of what checkerboarding was about, he began asking beekeepers, what's the thing that bothers them most? And invariably swarming came up and he said, fine, give me three years and I'll crack it. And he thinks he managed to do it in a couple of years. But initially he had to build credibility by publishing articles. So he wrote prolifically in the American Bee source journal and all of his writings all of his original writings and um, essays are freely available on um, on bee source so it's free there for anyone to go and have a look and after three years of uh, after a couple of years of looking into this aspect of how, how to prevent swarming 
Walter Wright was of the opinion that he, he was surprised at how it had taken so many tens of thousands of beekeepers looking in probably millions of beehives over many years that they hadn't come to this understanding and written it down. And this quote, I think, sums up Walter Wright and um, his fairly self-confident attitude to life. The fact that you'll find none of this information in your favourite reference books doesn't make it any less true. And he went on to say, it's, of course, it's easier to reject these concepts because they're new to you. So it's fair to say he didn't have a massive amount of traction throughout his life. Um, uh, and since then, since he's passed away in 2016, myself and others have picked this idea up and thought, you know, there really is something in this. So how does checkerboarding work? What it does is it what the bees, what they see as their ceiling and available stores changes by the act of checkerboarding. They want and need a solid block of stores before swarming, and they will increase their brood nest until they think they've reached a maximum colony size. So when we have these fractured stores, this encourages the bees to expand rapidly. And after they reach the, the limit of their brood size, they then go on to full colony, uh, full on nectar production something Walter Wright called survival mode. So basically they're looking at the winter to come, building up stores and looking to survive the oncoming winter. And if they're successful, if they're successful in filling all these gaps, going all the way to the top and in filling it with nectar, they can revert back to swarm preparation. So when they swarm anyway, according to Walter Wright, 100% not, they will not swarm, providing we follow these basic points. We must proceed, this act of checkerboarding has to proceed swarm preparation period in a timely fashion. You definitely need a, uh, a box of drawn empty comb and a box of stores above the brood. And you need to keep ahead of the bees all the time, leave lots and lots of space. And he believed, and we certainly believe through our experience, that this really becomes a thing of the past, the whole issuing of swarms and collecting swarms. So who says it works? Certainly Walter Wright did, and he wrote an awful lot in Bee Source. Uh, another chap that su uh, succeeded Walter Wright, Rob Koss, he wrote a few articles in Bee Source. There's a gentleman called Charles Illsley of Northwest New Jersey Beekeeping Association, and they've produced a really good YouTube video about an hour long where he talks through um, checkerboarding and describes how he went from collecting 30 to 40 swarms a year to actually leaving his ladders in the shed and just man manipulating his bees and taking off honey. And one of my favorite quotes is from a, a local beekeeper gentleman called Chris Farnham who keeps his bees on Dadens and he says it is a hell of a lot easier and I think I agree with him. So timing, I mentioned timing. What Walter Wright identified was something called the swarm cutoff point and this is the date on which the behaviour starts to change from swarm preparation to staying put, survival. And the first warning one of the first warnings often is the of swarm preparation is the appearance of drones. It doesn't necessarily mean because you have drones, your bees are going to swarm. And it doesn't mean because you haven't got drones, the bees are going to swarm or not. The drone, the preparation of drones usually um, starts the clock ticking and you can assume that six weeks later, it's highly possible that the bees will swarm. He then went on to describe this amazing concept called backfilling, which I'll come back to in a minute. And then a couple of weeks later, after the backfilling, a couple of weeks later, swarm cells begin to emerge and we know what that leads to. And Walter Wright reckoned that this swarm cutoff point, which is typically about mid apple blossom period, if you can check aboard your hives nine weeks prior to that, which typically is about early March, then um, that's it done and you can avoid swarming. So back in 2019, we did this on a couple of colonies. We had a wonderful uh, two week period at the end of February where we had a couple of weeks of really warm uh, weather. We did our checkerboarding and eight weeks later, one of the two colonies swarmed. And we were crestfallen. 
couldn't understand what happened. When we began to think about it, the difference between us and the US, in America, they've got a big continental landmass, well-defined seasons, and he could confidently say when his apple blossom period is going to be, when this swarm cutoff point is, and count backwards. For us, that can bounce around a week or two either way. So hence, in 2019, the spring was a little bit earlier and the bees had gone eight weeks after checkerboarding. So what we tend to do now is we go early and we actually do the checkerboarding activity before Christmas, sometime in December. And this can be done very quickly, but it removes all the uncertainty about um, timing and getting it right and making sure it's done in a well before this swarm cutoff point. So for each hive, we need to think if we're going to go step through the season and look at how we might prepare for the checkerboarding in December, it requires a bit of forethought and preparation. You're certainly going to need a box of honey frames. And you're also going to need another box of drawn empty frames so that you can alternate the frames and carry out the checkerboarding. In December, remember, you're not going into the brood. We're only manipulating the stores above the colony. And this can be done very quickly, this act of checkerboarding. You can take your box of stores off the colony, alternate with frames of drawn empty comb, and then put the two boxes back on so that we're not venting heat from the colony. And as I said before, timing, it needs to be done early, hence we do it in December. Here's some graphics from the book we wrote on checkerboarding, and it just shows the alternating frames, drawn comb stores, drawn comb stores, both laterally and vertically. Here I've got some examples. So there's the basic model. We've got a brood nest with a box of honey above it. And on the right, after checkerboarding, we've alternated those frames, those frames of stores with drawn empty comb. So we get this alternating frames vertically and laterally, the checkerboarding effect. In this example, you could do this with the, and feed fondant at the same time. So here, if you're concerned about your winter stores, um, you could add some fondant immediately above the brood using a feeder eek or a super but just make sure that your crown board stays at the top so you're not putting your fondant immediately on the crown board you need to, the bees need to have access to those frames those boxes that have got your checkerboarded stores so please if you're if you're thinking of checkerboarding and you want to add fondant remember to leave your crown board at the top and several of my colonists have got this um this kind of configuration right now as we speak Here's an example of checkerboarding, this time using a second brood box. So a number of my friends do this, not using two boxes, but use a single large British standard. Now, I'm not completely convinced about this because it hasn't stood the test of time. I'd like to see this happen for another year or two. The number of people I know who do it with a single box and so far they haven't swarmed, although the sample's pretty small, a handful of people. A lot of people ask me this question, aren't we creating a lot of space? Aren't the bees going to be cold? Well, personally, I don't think so. Yeah, I've thrown some examples here, which I've um, obtained from uh, beehives in Western Washington and Northwest New Jersey. And these are not checkerboarded colonies, but just to show that not everybody everywhere insulates their hive and they have much, much colder weather than we do. So. It's certainly going to come at a cost if you've got more space, they're bound to use a, a, a bit more of their stores. Um, so it's a consideration. If you are concerned, then do some insulation, carry out some insulation, some basic bubble wrap or something more comprehensive. But I don't think that given our temperatures, this is going to be a make or break for the colony survival. When we get to spring and the build up, we can expect this to be really rapid. They will expand rapidly. So please be mindful. Don't put a queen excluder on until your colony has fully expanded. You can do a tilt test, crack the boxes just to look in and see, are there, is there brood air there in those boxes or is the, are they actually starting to build it, bring in nectar?
And what we'll find is these colonies will expand rapidly, will have brood, will have a layer of cells that they're emptying out and drying out, whether they've got nectar or honey, uh, capped honey in them, in order for them to keep expanding. And then the bees and the nectar above. So if you do see these cells, these drying cells, this periphery of the brood nest begin to infill, you know that they're starting to think about swarm preparation. And that's a bit of a hint about what's to come with this concept of um, backfilling. Don't ignore the drones. Back in May 2019, um, we weren't using a queen excluder for this configuration. And we could see here that the bees took the queen up across a couple of supers, um, found her some empty cells, laid some drone, and then took her back down. So we tend to now um, make some provision for the drones by adding couple of frames in each box of drone cell um, just so that they to try and offset this and compact the nest down a bit and and also keep her out of the the supers that you really want to keep for honey so summer nectar management is the expression that Walter Wright began to to use so he moved away from this concept of checkerboarding because once the checkerboarding's done effectively all you're doing is managing the space, you're managing the space above the bees and managing the nectar, the incoming nectar and honey. So he changed his term from uh, checkerboarding for this, this concept of checkerboarding to nectar management. So keep ahead of the bees in the summer, always at least a couple of boxes. And when I say ahead of the bees, I'm talking about nectar, not the actual physical bees. If you see those boxes beginning to fill with nectar, stay a couple of boxes ahead of them. Initially, when we did this, we had these skyscrapers, these towers. We don't do that anymore. We tend to actually keep these towers, these hives down to a manageable size by either taking off the boxes of honey as they fill, are filled and capped and or storing them, taking them off, emptying them of bees and storing them on a non checkerboarded hive so, we, so that you can do a one time extraction. What are the benefits of checkerboarding? And we've experienced all of these definitely fewer inspections a nice byproduct is you get a one-for-one -one change swap over with the queen supersedure definitely haven't had any swarming or swarm preparation and more honey what a nice problem that would be to have and some of the drawbacks definitely need to think about your hive stands to support taller hives you need a good solid base then definitely needs to be flat you might need help handling these taller hives. You might need more equipment if you're going to be, if we get a good year, I mean, no guarantee we ever get a good year, but uh, if you get a good year, you might need some more supers. And, then, and, yeah, and what a nice problem that would be to have more outlets required to, to sell our honey. So if none of the aforementioned is for you, then this concept of backfilling is something we can all incorporate within our beekeeping. Um, and what backfilling is, it's the replacement of the brood in the top of the brood nest with uncapped nectar uh, and honey in order to reduce the nest. Essentially, once the bees have decided they're going to swarm, and this is an example of a colony that has not been checkerboarded, that's going into swarm preparation mode and, and creating queen cells, they know they're going to lose a third, a half of their colony, and they cannot support that colony. The, the, the bees that are left behind in the parent hive will not be able to support a brood nest that size. So what you find happens is when they're starting to make swarm preparation, you can see on the left there, there's the cluster, the bees clustered over winter in the middle. They began to expand. They've got to the point where they think, right, we're good to go. We're going to now um, begin thinking about swarm preparation before they actually begin making swarm cells swarm cells they will reduce the nest down by infilling it backfilling it with um with nectar in order to reduce down the, the size of the nest this does a number of things it provides a residual uh, and some additional stores for the residual colony for the parent colony and it reduces down the capacity of the brood nest for the new queen when she's up and running so they haven't got that huge volume of, of brood to have to support with a reduced workforce and it's a really, really good indication of swarm preparation because it occurs a couple of weeks before queen cell construction. 
And this is a picture picture that we took when we were um, going through our colonies initially to make sure that this really was running true to form, true to what Walter Wright described. So we'd go through each colony, take lots of photos, um, map the hives, and here you can see that the um, the brood net the the brood nest is being reduced down. You can see the nectar beginning to be, come into the brood nest as they shrink it. And we took this photograph a couple of weeks before this colony went into swarm preparation without actually realizing that this was happening at the time. So only when we backtracked, looked at our records, looked at our photos that we thought, oh, there's an example of this concept. Here's an example of this concept of backfilling. And there's so much that goes on inside a colony. I never noticed this in my 11 years of beekeeping until I read about it and started looking for it through the work of Walter Wright. This uh, book on checkerboarding, which is available from all the usual suspects, thorns, Northern Bee books and Amazon. Here's some graphics of some of Walter Wright's hives. We don't go for anything this big now. We've kind of learned, to learn as we went along. And a couple of graphics here, just to show my colleagues, Anita on the left, Jill in the middle, and my colonies on the right. Um, and these are, this was our first year of checkerboarding before we realized actually we can modify this and reduce these down a bit. And these are my hives at the beginning of last year, although we had a dreadful year, the three colonies at the back, the blue, the black and the yellow roofed hives are all checkerboarded. I didn't get any honey last year or very little. And, um, but still, you know, as part of the winter, coming out of the winter with those stores, they really went for it, expanded quickly. Um, and so everything was in place had we actually had a bit more of a productive season. And finally, this question again, which of these has the greatest priority for bees, the parent colony or the issuing swarm? What do you think? The answers, of course, are all in our book. So that's the end of this talk on checkerboarding. Good luck to you and your bees.